So I'm going to start that now. And first off, I want to welcome everyone for joining us uh, to the fall lecture series. This is the International Studies Institute's annual fall lecture series. And the focus this year is the politics of water. So I am not going to be doing introductions today, but I just want to extend some thank yous and then I'll pass it over to Jamie to introduce today's speaker. Um, first, I want to thank Jamie, of course, who has done yeoman's work in curating all of our speakers and helping to bring this, this series together. Appreciate all of her work. And uh, the International Studies Institute's director, Stephen Bishop. Um, also, this year, um, well, like most years, but in particular this year because of COVID, funding has been scarce. So I want to extend thanks to the Latin American and Iberian Institute here at UNM as well as UNM Sustainability Studies Program, um, the Grant Challenges Program, and also the Departments of Political Science and the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. And of course, I wanna thank all of you for taking time out and zooming into another screen. I really appreciate it. Your attendance is so important to all of us. And I'm gonna pass it over now to Jamie to introduce our speaker. Great, thanks so much, Ian, and thank you to the International Studies Institute for making all of this happen. I'm so happy to see, see some of you. I know some of my students don't have their cameras on yet, but um, we're really fortunate today to welcome Dr. Susan Spronk. She's an associate professor at the University of Ottawa in the School of International Development and Global Studies. Uh, as with our other speakers this semester, Dr. Spronk's research contributes important insights on the politics of water in Latin America. But she brings a unique and important perspective to the study of development, something I really liked on your website, um, which is, as, as, as she puts it, the ex she studies the experience of development. And um, this really brings to light the lived experiences or the impacts of neoliberalism, for example, and the mobilization of groups across Latin America that seek to address water injustices in countries like including Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, Uruguay, and El Salvador. Um, and today we're fortunate to hear about one of her latest projects that caught off the press that she'll be talking to us about, which focuses on uh, municipal services and the critical connections between water and security and COVID-19 pandemic. So um, this book is, is I, I don't know Susan, if you're gonna show pictures of it, um, but it's, it's titled Public Water and COVID-19, Dark Clouds and Silver Linings. So Great. I'll let you take it over. Okay, well, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you to all of you for being here and please uh, accept my sympathy and condolences for all of you who have lost family members, friends. Uh, we've all been impacted by COVID-19. I will be talking about the crisis today. Trigger warning, I know that that's a difficult issue for a lot of people. Um, and the title of my talk is Water, Health and COVID Lessons from Latin America. I will say that the book is a global book and so we're only talking about Latin America in a few chapters. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And it gives me an opportunity to tell you about the Municipal Services Project as well. So my lecture today, and I'm gonna to try to be as brief as possible and get you to participate as well. So please stay tuned. Um, it's gonna be based on three questions. What is what are the connections between water and public health and what has COVID-19 exposed about these connections? Secondly, what is the Municipal Services Project, project I've been working with, and why have we focused on public service providers? And then thirdly, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on public uh, providers, water and sanitation operators, including in Latin America and the Caribbean? Although the three, the uh, Three country cases we talk about in the book are from Latin America. There's none from, well, actually there's one from Jamaica, but I'm not gonna talk about it today. Okay, uh, so actually the first thing I want to do is to turn the question over to you. As I mentioned, uh, COVID has impacted all of our lives, but it's also shown a spotlight on a lot of different kinds of inequalities. I've really been surprised and heartened to hear some of the public debate in Canada, but also in the US as well. Certainly we share a common media space in terms of looking at these questions of inequality. So I would like to do what's called a chat cascade. So this is your chance to open up the chat, which should be in the bar of your Zoom apparatus. And what I want you to do is to name one of those inequalities that have ex been exposed that's most important to you, that's really come to the fore for you during this COVID experience. And I want you to type your answer into the chat, but please don't hit return until I say so. So I'll just give you 30 seconds to do that. 
10 seconds left. Okay, please hit go. Great. So I'll resp some of these answers include uh, rural communities in the Amazon not reaching services, health service inequality, testing ability in poor states, race and class, internet and computer access. That's one that certainly affects a lot of us in the education sector. Racial inequalities, specifically those within the healthcare system, BIPOC, severely impacted compared to white people, housing inequality and security, income inequality, housing and security, I'll keep going here, uh, geography, healthcare, healthcare technology, insurance, health insurance particularly in the US has been a big issue that's gotten global attention. How school charges too much for education. Yes, true in the US, also true in Canada. So very, access to clean water, certainly. <laughs> Um, one of the things I'm going to impress upon you, though, is actually public operators in particular have been fairly good at responding to this crisis, since so this is what our book tries to document. Um, okay. So I'll just start with making some of those connections between water and health. Again, I am, as Jamie mentioned, a, an expert more on the politics and sociology of water. I'm not an epidemiolo epidemiologist, another word we've all learned to pronounce in the context of this crisis. Uh, but I think one, it, it's rather obvious to talk about water in the context of COVID. Uh, this is a graphic that comes from my public health provider, Ottawa Public Health. I live in Ottawa, Canada. And of course, as we've all heard in the news, uh, in terms of preventing transmission of this virus, there are three main recommendations. The first one is hand washing, uh, keeping a distance of two meters from other people and staying home when you're sick. And of course, number one, I should say, is actually wearing face masks. But hand washing uh, is still number two. Of course, this is a viral infection that is mostly trans uh, transmitted through respiratory droplets. But hand washing is also still highly recommended because it does help to break down uh, the virus and to reduce the viral load. And so it does remain one of the main recommendations. So this begs the question for those of us who are concerned about access to water, what does this mean in terms of if you can't have access to water, then you can't wash your hands, you can't follow these public directives. And it's even noted uh, by public health professionals that washing your hands with dirty water is better than no water at all. So uh, even those communities who may have access to water but not water quality, access to water in and of itself, especially with the addition to soap, uh, is a very important means to, to reduce this virus. In terms of water and health though, uh, one of the main connections that we see in terms of the importance of public water and public health or water and public health is uh, diseases, uh, particularly diarrheal uh, diseases. And so I've got two graphics here that come from data that's collected by the World Health Organization. And this, the first graph here is 10 global causes of disease. And we see that heart disease is actually number one and that diarrheal diseases, which I've awkwardly circled with my, uh, my um, PowerPoint presentation is actually uh, number nine on this list. But I think what's really important to note in this graph is that when we live in Canada and the US, uh, most of the public research and development, public investment, certainly the debate on COVID-19 in Canada, I'm sure in the US as well, has really been dominated by the questions of finding a vaccine for this virus, right? So this research and development all on the vaccine. And we lose sight in that conversation sometimes, or at least I'm concerned that we lose sight of what we need to do to prevent what are called communicable diseases, maternal, neonatal, neonatal and nutritional conditions. And these diseases or these red line diseases are really diseases of poverty or diseases that can be, their spread can be prevented through the access or better access to what I'm going to call the social determinants of health and just briefly introduce you that concept. So if you look at these 10 global causes of disease, heart disease, stroke, uh, chronic obstruct obstructive pulmonary disease, again, diarrheal disease is only second from the bottom. We see how different that is in low-income countries. So in low-income countries, 
Number one, lower respiratory infections. And number two are diarrheal diseases. And most of the people who are affected by diarrheal diseases are under the age of five. And so we lose you know, 3 million children a year uh, to diarrheal diseases. And this is certainly a concern. Uh, this is something that will only be fixed by basic investments in technology that we've had for a long time, which include things like water pumps, water systems, improved water sources. Diarrheal diseases are prevented through access to WASH technology, which is uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene. So that would be clean water, means to clean and treat water and take our wastewater away, and hygiene, such as access to soap, uh, which keeps us healthy. So one of the things that this uh, outbreak has really meant for me, and certainly uh, for many of us in the room, I'm 44, which means that I've been on the few times more around the planet than perhaps many of the students who are joining us today. Uh, but it's the first pandemic of this type that uh, we've experienced all in our lifetime. Uh, we should remember that there's another global pandemic which still rages, which is the HIV AIDS pandemic. Of course, COVID is a different pandemic because it is uh, transmitted through respiratory means rather than as sexually transmitted or through blood products, um, which lends to different kinds of dynamics. It's also meant that it's gotten more attention in terms of uh, money, uh, research, etc. And so there's this slogan going around that we're all in this together. And I think we've learned uh, through the context of this crisis, and you've certainly mentioned it when all of you put in the chat, no, we're not all in this together. In fact, there's incredible inequality in access. And so I think one of the things that this crisis has taught me was the importance of the social determinants of health, or perhaps not taught me, but reinforced the importance of the social determinants of health. So the social determinants of health is a concept that tries to look at the structural roots of why we see these inequality of outcomes and basic health, uh, health outcomes in different populations in the world. So here I'm quoting from the WHO, the World Health Organization, which says that the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global national and local levels. The social determinants of health are mostly responsible for health inequities, the unfair and unavoidable differences in health status seen within and between countries. When the WHO in 1990, uh, or to, sorry, in 2008 um, commissioned this report, uh, it was a high, uh, it was a panel that included uh, doctors and public health, it was actually considered to be a very, very radical uh, approach to health that is very difficult, different from the medicalized model that you might hear. And I encourage any of you who listen to the news to take note, if you hear a medical doctor talk about COVID, it's often focused on the individuals in terms of the effects of the virus on the body. Public health officials have a very different approach. And when they answer questions that the journalists are asking them, they tend to really focus on the community or all these questions about structure, about inequality, about power. And so this, according to a colleague of mine who's worked in the United Nations system, noted that the 2008 uh, commission report on the social determinants of health was actually extremely radical and caused shockwaves throughout the WHO and the global community in terms of the pointed nature in which it pointed, um, pointed to questions of inequality. And they note the poor health of the poor, the social gradients in health within countries and the marked health inequities between countries are caused by the unequal distribution of power, income, goods and services globally and nationally. This unequal distribution of health damaging experiences is not in any sense a natural phenomenon, but it is the result of a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs unfair economic arrangements and bad politics. Together, the structural determinants and conditions of daily life constitute the social determinants of health and are responsible for a major part of health inequities between and within countries. 
And so one of the things, those of you who had a chance to read the chapter uh, that Jamie uh, sent to you that I've contributed to the book that I'll talk to you about in a moment. That's why when I was asked to contribute a chapter in our book about inequality, I decided that in order to understand the impact of a pandemic such as COVID-19, we must do, do through, through the lenses of gender justice and also environmental racism in terms of helping us understand how the impact of this virus will really be uh, one that we need to look at in terms of these structural inequalities. And as a group of social scientists, I'm sure you do not need a lot of convincing about this fact. But the other thing that I put forward in this chapter, and I do encourage you to read it if you get a chance and let me know what you think, uh, is to make a case for universal basic, basic services as a means to address this pandemic. I was reading uh, and preparing for this chapter, uh, public health journals and even some public health professionals uh, note that rather than just focusing on vaccine development, we can also think about the, the reduction in, of viruses such as this pandemic through the basic services that we need to keep ourselves well and healthy, such as housing, such as water and education, and also health, water and sanitation and health services. And that this actually might be a way to, most equitable way to advance. And I also make an argument within, because before COVID, one of my existential crises, of course, was the questions of climate change. And so universal basic services is also a project which is connected to uh, new um, ideas around the new green deal that have come forward from Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez endorsed by Bernie Sanders and others. Um, also the UK Labour Party in terms of a way to create a future that is focused on care rather than one that's focused on the uh, dogged pursuit of profit. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work that I've been doing uh, since the beginning of my career uh, with the Municipal Services Project. So we are a group of academics who work with social movement organizations such as civil society organizations. Uh, one of the organizations that we've worked with in the most recent phase of the project is the Red Vida, which is the network of organizations throughout Latin America who are interested in pursuing alternatives to privatization, uh, very strong in countries in the past such as Bolivia, Uruguay, and Colombia. Uh, and we published a number of books. It's a, it's a project that's really uh, was born in the context of uh, the shift towards privatization in South Africa in the mid-1990s. Uh, when the government of, uh, of the African National Congress was elected to office in 1994, they made a shift turn to new liberal policies and started privatizing water, uh, water services. And so this group of academics were very instrumental in documenting uh, things like there was a cholera outbreak, for example, in uh, Durban. Uh, in exposing these crises and also getting legislative change, uh, for example, to push for a basic lifeline supply, which is remains a policy in South Africa. A basic lifeline supply means uh, that each household in South Africa gets six kiloliters of water per month, uh, basically for free. And then after that paying tariffs. Now there's problems with that policy, but again, it's something that we have not seen in Latin America, but we see uh, more and more people pushing for in places like Colombia. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So now I'm going to do another vote and uh, here we'll have to do a very rough uh, estimate in terms of your responses. But I know you've been talking about the politics of water in Latin America since the beginning of the semester. So I have a question for you. We've been working on public water resources in the last phases of this project, uh, which started in 2008. Uh, but previous to that, we spent the about 18 years looking at the problems of privatization and then noticed that, wow, you know, we know a lot about privatization, but we actually know way less than we should about public providers. But I want to know from you, how prevalent are private sector operators in water and sanitation in Latin America? So again, we're gonna do a chat cascade here and I'll read your responses and we'll have to get a rough estimate in terms of what people think is the case. 
Do you think that private providers are dominant? That is that they represent more than 90% of spending in Latin America, in the water and sanitation sector. Are they important? That is maybe they provide about half of the water in Latin America, or are they not important at all? Less than 90% of the spending. So again, take a minute. So think about it. And then when I say go, I encourage you to write your answer in the chat. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. I'll count down five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay, let me know. Dominant, important, dominant, more than 90% dominant, important. Wow, that's really interesting. Okay, I'm gonna show you some stats. Not important, important. Okay, let's go look at what actually is happening in Latin America in terms of private versus public provision. Look at this people. The blue is public and the red is private. In fact, private companies are only really important in Mexico, Brazil, and Peru. When we look at the sample average, and again, these statistics were from 2017, and they represent the percentage of spending of these countries as a percent of GDP in select country. And Ecuador is not on this list. And if Ecuador was on this list, they would also have a red bar on the top because they have a very important concession contract still in, in Guayaquil, which has been actually one of the most uh, impacted regions in Latin America very early on by the COVID virus. But if you look at the bar that I've indicated here with the arrow, you can see that it's actually less than 10%. So this is an interesting question in terms of the sociology of knowledge, because certainly privatization has dominated the conversation about water and sanitation services, uh, not only in Latin America, but elsewhere as well. Uh, so for example, uh, there's a research by Kamari and Sharma, and they did what's called an expert review where they looked at the published research on the thematic distribution of research on infrastructure financing. And this is infrastructure writ large rather than just water and sanitation. But again, this is really revealing. Uh, so 53% of all the work that's published in peer reviewed journals is on public private partnerships. 5% is on public investments, 13% on private investments, and then 11% on foreign direct investments. And so again, I think even though when we look up, public providers are really the ones who are providing the majority of people in the world, including in Latin America and the Caribbean, where privatization made great inroads, particularly in the 1990s, we see that the public imagination is really dominated by this question of privatization, rather than trying to understand what public operators are doing and what are they doing right and what are they doing wrong. So what we did um, with the Public Services Project is to look at and try to systematize public providers. So we've been doing that since 2008. And so the project that I'm going to tell you about next, which is the new book we have coming out, although I encourage you to look at our website because we do make sure to publish everything on our website that we can because we do work with trade unions with civil society organizations who don't have subscriptions to peer reviewed academic journals, which are also privatized because they're behind paywalls. Um, so we've been systematizing public experiences. But that said, I just want to jog your memory in terms of what are some of the problems or the limits of privatization that we've seen based upon the research that we've done over the last, again, 20 years. So one of the things uh, that we contend at the Municipal Services Project in terms of the limits of privatization is that private financing is actually more expensive than public financing. Even though there's all this emphasis, and I'll talk to you about this in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, but also in the context of meeting the needs of communities in COVID-19, we see still this emphasis on private capital as the only one that has the money available, the money that will solve these crises. But in fact, because states are uh, able to have a reliable source of 
money through tax revenue, it's actually cheaper for the public sector to borrow money than it is for private financiers to borrow money. So in fact, public money is cheaper. Public-private partnerships, and we've seen this uh, certainly in some of the more spectacular blow-ups in Latin America in terms of high-profile cases of such as Oblivion Water War in Cochabamba in 2000, and then followed, of course, by the cancellation of the contract in El Alto La Paz in 2005. I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at those questions earlier on in my career. But these public-private partnerships are actually very complex and difficult to monitor monitor and it's not guaranteed that they improve efficiency, especially when we understand efficiency in a more global sense and we use the term social efficiency in our project to talk about this. And what we mean is that often what we see in terms of the gains of privatization in terms of reducing the costs, usually they do that by firing people <laughs> and hiring people back on contract in precarious labor contracts where they're not enjoying uh, decent work. So again, part-time short-term contracts. So most of the gains we've seen in a lot of privatization cases have been brought through restructuring the labor force. And this lends to other questions about development. And for anyone who's interested in that question, I can uh, introduce you to the work of Kate Bayless, who is one of my favorite people who's been looking at this question in the context of privatization, efficiency, and development. But we know there's also problems of lack of transparency and democratic accountability. Uh, the Canadian government, for example, has really jumped on board this, um, this new agenda. So they set up this platform, which is supposed to bring all these global investors together. It's called Convergence. And so uh, when you go to that platform, you can't even really see what's on there because these become secrets. You need to protect your information when you're bidding against other people in a market. And we have a problem in information transfer when we have a private provider who has to report to the public regulator. We see that there's always problems of information flow and there's problems of transparency. Uh, we've seen so many cases where uh, people have not even, like the citizens of those who are affected by privatization don't even get to see the contract. And so there's so many questions I think that get raised about democratic accountability. Uh, and they're particularly poor choice in countries with weak state capacity for regulation. Again, we can raise the context of Bolivia in 2000, 2005, uh, when those privatizations were particularly disastrous and led to uh, social mobilization and very, very poor terms on that contract. It's sort of shocking to see that uh, within the Cochabamba contract, it was true that all of the water within the concession contract was to become the property of the private provider, which was extremely controversial in a context where you have peasant producers within that uh, concession area who are depending on water supplies for their basic livelihoods. So a very explosive situation. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, the book. And so we've pulled together a book uh, called Public Water and COVID-19 Dark Clouds and Silver Linings. And Maud Barlow, who is one of my favorite water campaigners, water warriors, says of our book uh, that this is an excellent and timely collection that highlights the importance of democratic and equitable water services. If any good can come from this terrible pandemic, it is the recognition that public services are vital components of fundamental justice for a post COVID world. So in the introduction of our book, uh, we draw attention uh, to one of the reports that came forward in October, 2020. UN special rapporteur such as Leo Heller, who is this UN rapporteur for water and sanitation and a number of others rapporteurs on human rights and housing, et cetera, signed an op-ed, and this is actually quite uh, not unconventional for UN rapporteurs to take the public scene like this, in the Guardian where they said that COVID-19 has exposed the, exposed the catastrophic impact of privatizing vital services. And we've seen this in the healthcare uh, as well, uh, very, very dramatically where, for example, in Spain, uh, the Spanish government decided in the context of the pandemic to actually retake into the public sector a number of the hospitals 
Because if you're a private manager in a hospital that's running, uh, that needs to run a uh, surplus budget, you simply have to close down the services when they become unviable, when you're running a deficit. And that is not true of the public sector, which actually has a much better ability as well to accumulate debt. And debt is necessary in a time of crisis uh, such as this one. Uh, but some of the observations that we make uh, in our book, and here I'm quoting from the, the introduction, and this is put very well in the contribution which comes from some French researchers where they're having their own battle against privatization in France in a very similar way that we saw in Latin America in the early parts of the 2000s when we saw these social movements uh, pushing back against the private sector. But they put it as uh, public water providers focus on long-term consequences and so they're able to have a much longer term horizon to look at um, the effect of infrastructure development, for example, um, to think about rather than just a short term focus on profit. Also, there's a general commitment to defending water as a public good rather than treating water as a commodity. And very importantly, I think the working conditions tend to be better for the workers within the used utilities, and that has very important benefits for development as well. And we saw this in the book, and this cuts across the case studies, and a number of the authors within the book uh, comment on it, that particularly in terms of job stability. So we haven't seen layoffs in the public utilities. And again, this was a book that was put together during a crisis. It's not a global survey. It's based upon our network. It doesn't make an attempt to compare the private sector with the public sector. But again, these are some of the lessons that are learned that kind of cut across the uh, 28 chapters. So let me turn to tell you a little bit about what we say in this book about uh, Latin America, which is the topic of this class. So we have 28 chapters, uh, and so six of these are from Latin America. So one of these chapters is on Caracas, Venezuela, controversial case, of course, uh, given the uh, Maduro. Um, this chapter is by Rebecca McMillan, and she argues in this chapter uh, that the social public model of water management, and one of the interesting things about Venezuela is that there are some incredible innovations in terms of community-based water management that came from the city of Caracas that actually predated Chavez. Uh, these, uh, these experiments emerged in the 1990s, early 1990s, before Chavez was elected, which was in uh, 1999, 1998, excuse me. Um, and so, but it was generalized across the country and certainly expanded, especially during the first years of the Chavez administration, when oil prices were high, of course, and the government was spending a lot of money and in investments in basic infrastructure. And so there was a whole uh, series of what are called Mesas Technicas de Agua, or the water technical tables that have spread across the country. And this was a way to bring together the public utility managers and the community uh, members in terms of resolving problems of uh, water crises. And it led to massive improvements, especially in Caracas, uh, in um, at least before 2014. And Venezuela claimed to have met the Millennium Development Goals for Water uh, by 2010, which was five years ahead of schedule. Uh, but as Rebecca notes in this chapter that she contributes to this book, that that social public model of water management has really declined since 2014 um, due to cyclical drought, poorly maintained infrastructure, hyperinflation, declining government oil revenues, and also the US sanctions has, have made it very difficult uh, to get equipment imported uh, for infrastructure projects. So she calls for uh, public investment, renewed commitments to community participation, but also uh, transparency and improved transparency to strengthen that social public model. The chapter on Uruguay as well uh, is also one that more is about dark clouds rather than silver linings. I would say the Caracas one is too. This is certainly not, these are not cases of well-performing public utilities per se, but um, uh, at least not uh, as examples, um, but, Uruguay is one of the countries in Latin America that has the best statistics in terms of water and sanitation coverage. Uh, 
And it's also one of the outliers in the region. Uh, it's contained the virus <clears throat> much better than others in the region. It also has a strong tradition of public enterprises, robust healthcare system, and universal access to basic services. Uh, but of course, uh, in the fall, there's a rise to power of uh, right-wing uh, market-oriented coalition that has replaced the Frente Amplio. And the authors of this chapter are very concerned that the public utility, which is a national one, is moving towards hard principles of full cost recovery, which may compromise the ability of the utility to expand infrastructure into the areas of the country uh, that remain in rural areas, but also to maintain the infrastructure that exists in uh, the city. For example, Uruguay has a big problem with water losses in terms of water that's lost to dilapidated infrastructure under the ground. We have four chapters from Colombia, and I think the reason why we have four chapters from Colombia is because that is probably the country where we have one of the more vibrant social movements in favor of public water uh, in Latin America. Again, I think the, that hat used to be worn by Bolivia, but since the election of Evo Morales, uh, who's now uh, his party is back in government, uh, but when that happened, of course, the Morales government had a commitment to public water. And so the social movements, of course, in terms of its cycles has died down. But Colombia is still in, in the full front uh, in terms of trying to improve access. Um, and the social movement actors, there are also not just concerned about the privatization in terms of the, all of the, uh, the water companies that we look at in this book are actually public companies. But in Colombia, the activists are quite concerned that the public companies are becoming what we call corporatized or public companies that start to act much more like private companies. And so especially this chapter on Medellin uh, talks about how the measures that were put in place to deal with COVID, uh, such as suspending debt repayment, giving customers more flexible terms of financing to pay their water bills, also allowing families to up their pre-charge in prepaid water uh, cards in their prepaid water meters. So you were allowed to pre-charge 30 cubic meters of water instead of the standard eight to nine per month. Uh, and also the, they've suspended nationally all water cutoffs in Colombia uh, and reinstalled services of those uh, households that have been cut off. But the activists who wrote this chapter are also concerned that these measures are not necessarily free and that there's more that the government could be doing in terms of investing in services and also uh, relieving the burden especially for low-income families. Uh, the chapter on the Red Nacional de Acueductos Comunitarios de Colombia, the National Network of Community WAC Products, is a really fascinating chapter that talks about the experience of these formal informal providers and sort of the the liminal space that they occupy in the context of the law. Uh, Colombia, of course, is a neoliberal state that also uh, has commitments to become a socially responsible state under its constitution. And so there's a lot of social contests in terms of how to this, uh, this tension that exists within the legal framework. And so this chapter looks at the community providers and the ambiguous role they play, uh, and also uh, talks about how many of the provisions that were put forward at the national level didn't really seem to apply to these community aqueducts who are always sort of not quite sure where they figure figure in this whole regulatory apparatus. Uh, the chapter on Bogota, which is about Colombia as a whole, uh, also highlights that Colombia has a long-standing tension between ensuring service access and also ensuring that the utility itself has reliable utility revenue. And notes that since the late 1990s, new liberal model has uh, prioritized punitive and less redistributive or full cost recovery models of water services. And, but they note in this chapter that they see some hope in the fact that this crisis has really highlighted the necessity of a basic supply or a minimum vital, as they call it in the chapter, as similar to what we saw in South Africa that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. And then last not, but not least, uh, we see the case of Buena Ventura. This is a fascinating case for those of you who are interested in social movements. Uh, it tells the story of a civic strike that shut down the city for 23 days in 2017. It was over a crisis uh, due to uh, water. 
and uh, it elicited the uh, election of a progressive mayor. And so in 2002, the utility in Buena Ventura was actually privatized. It's called Hidro Pacifico. This is a small city of about 400,000 people. And uh, what we have going on now is a case of re-municipalization or the city is preparing itself to, to take again over the water utility to take it back into public hands. And this is a trend that we've seen uh, quite phenomenally uh, take place throughout parts of Europe. Uh, France, for example, canceled the Parisian uh, contract uh, a number of years ago. But we've also seen a uh, big movement in the United States uh, towards remunicipalization. And I'd encourage you to look at the work of Mildred Warner for those of you who are interested in these politics. And of course, there's many reasons why cities and counties, et cetera, countries will decide to take back their public water services. And in this case, it's really one of those cases of a, of a social movement. Um, Buena Ventura is also an interesting case in the context of COVID because according to the authors, the uh, Buena Ventura is the, the city in Colombia with the highest fatality rate of COVID-19. And they argue that unfortunately, uh, in the context of this pandemic, this private provider knows more or less that it's gonna be kicked out of the city. And so they do not have a lot of incentives right now to improve the services for the residents. And in fact, in the context of the crisis, there was a dilapidated pipeline uh, that fell into the river and cut service uh, for some communities uh, from their water supply for a number of, of days. And so uh, there's a lot of concerns there about the failure of the private company to invest in the utility. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up very quickly here, but I'll just summarize in terms of the major themes of the book here. And this is again, global, going back to the global. So the lessons learned is that there's some dark clouds for, for public water operators. Uh, the financial crunch has certainly affected public water operators as well. Um, one of the estimates uh, that we quote in the book is that um, the International Benchmarking Network for Water and Sanitation Utilities uh, noted in June 2020 that collection rates in water utilities globally has fallen 40% and prices have also gone up in terms of the price of providing services. Uh, it's often necessary to have, uh, well, personal protective equipment to protect the workers, also enhanced uh, sanitization protocols has also increased labor costs uh, in a lot of utilities. And in the chapter on that surveys the Red Nacional of the community providers, uh, utilities have also taken steps to try to really make sure that they've improved their water quality in the context of the crisis, which also means more cost. There's also, uh, again, as I noted in Medellin and Uruguay, in, there's an intensifying trend for commercialization in the context of this financial cr crunch. So that's gonna be something that we're gonna want to look uh, to keep track of. And of course, uh, the World Bank is still doubling down on privatization. And now the discourse has really moved. I think in the 1990s and the early 2000s, the big emphasis was on concession contracts, trying to get big multinational water companies such as Suez, Veolia, to come and provide their expertise and services in places like Latin America. So we saw big concession contracts in places like Argentina, Bolivia. Um, big ones that were canceled actually. But now what they're focusing on is the money. So what the big discourse is, and this is in the context of the sustainable development goals is what's called blended financing. And this is a very simple idea. It sounds like it's a new thing, but it's not a new thing. It's a very old thing. It's basically using public money. So public money would include money from the World Bank, which is a multilateral lender to entice the private sector to come and invest. Uh, so my government is also big on this agenda. I'm pretty sure USAD is as well. And so I think this is really something we need to think about and not to be fooled by fancy words. It's often called innovative financing as well. How so it includes some elements of blended financing. And I was just at a webinar that was organized by the Agence Française de Développement or the French Development Agency and World Bank folks were there. And again, this is really what they're saying. And they're like, there's trillions of dollars in public banks around the world and we can use this money to leverage it to get more private capital. But then we can go back to that slide that I mentioned in the beginning and thinking about, well, is that really going to be the best way considering the fact that water is actually provided by the public sector? Why don't we spend more time and thought about improving the public sector in terms of rather than trying to privatize it? <laughs>
So in the book, we also document, and I'm just going to do this very quickly because there's a whole long chart in the book that you can go look at yourself. Uh, but we take note of some of the examples of progressive actions that have been taken by water public, public water operators in the context of COVID-19, including making services more affordable. In Burkina Faso, for example, in uh, West Africa, the government uh, provided water absolutely for free. They stopped charging for water services altogether. Um, and so uh, different utilities have done different things. They've uh, payment referrals, reduced the rates, free allocations of water, also trying to target uh, those most in need of subsidies. Also certainly uh, keeping people connected to services. This is one of the main recommendations of the United Nations reports, uh, especially connected to gender equity, very, very important to keep people connected to their services. So again, countries such as Colombia have passed a moratorium on cutoffs, uh, also to reconnect those who had been disconnected from their services try as best they can to repair breakdowns, interruptions, and ensuring those services. And also we've seen in the context of Venezuela that the government has uh, also increased um, emergency water tanks. And of course, when you don't have the infrastructure on the ground, one of the provisional ways to provide water is through uh, water tanks. Uh, and uh, home tap yards and, and community taps is more a phenomenon that we see in parts of Africa rather than uh, Although certainly in informal settlements uh, in places in Latin America as well, and anywhere where there are displaced people, this is a key, key, key step in terms of making sure that uh, people have ac adequate access to water and sanitation during a public health crisis, those who are living in uh, displaced peoples who are living in refugee camps. Uh, so I think there's, an, I'm going to end with this. Uh, so I think there's two lessons learned, at least in terms of the silver linings, and that is that pandemics really do change history. And so we have a moment, and we quote Arantati Roy in the beginning of the book, where she calls the COVID-19 epidemic a portal, a portal where we can see into the future and we have a chance to think about things differently. Uh, we note in the book that the cholera epidemic in England in the 19th century was actually the thing that brought modern water and sanitation to the city of London and elsewhere. Uh, plague in the 1920s in Nigeria and Lagos, Nigeria was also the major uh, trigger that encouraged political leaders to make different decisions and invest in basic services such as water and sanitation. And I think we can see some exciting movements happening in Colombia where the chapter on Colombia on Bogota talks about the idea for support for a minimo vital or basic minimum lifestyle lifetime supply, but also really interesting, the chapter on Medellin, which is written by people who were engaged in social movement activist, activism there, talk about maximos vitalis rather than a minimo vital. And what they mean by that is this. So they say, maximo vitalis refers to the integral development and dignity of the human being, issues that cannot be addressed by covering minimum needs but rather require that all forms of oppression and vulnerability be eradicated. And this is quoting a social leader from a group of scholars and activists looking at these questions. Among the vital maximums for a dignified life is an expansive notion of socioeconomic rights, including food, essential public services, housing, and education. Okay. So then I have a question for you, but unless you have questions for me. So my question for you, and here we can, I don't know how you normally do this, Jamie, in terms of organizing the group for taking the floor. But my questions for you would be, how do you think this pandemic might change history and how might it change the conversation about water and sanitation in Latin America or in your own community? There you go. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, Dr. Sprank, thank you. Um, what do, you do you want to, I, I think maybe, maybe let's, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, should we, I want to make sure that we have some time for people's questions for you. Let's and just so, have their questions. <laughs> yeah, fine. okay, great. Okay, so well, let's, let's see where we're at. And then we could um, engage these questions if we're sort of up for exploring our own experiences and ideas here. Um, I, I, I might kick us off if um, when people are coming in um, to ask questions. So we've had 
a bit of a focus on um, sort of, I think that big utilities get a lot of attention um, in, in research on water. And in our class, we've talked a lot about sort of these um, areas that get less attention in terms of um, peri, peri urban areas and formal settlements where there's trucker, trucked water um, and, and, and then in rural areas. And what I'm wondering about is, is do, you, do you sort of see that there's more efficacy for these areas in COVID-19 or is there, would you think that, that the public utilities are sort of garnering a lot of the attention still? Well, I think by the nature of the fact that this is a virus that is related to population density, mm -hmm. it's primarily urban. Right? It's not to say that the rural areas aren't affected, but by virtue of the fact that in most rural areas, people won't be living in densely populated uh, settlements. I mean, the exception for that would be the informal settlements in places like Brazil. And one of the things I mentioned in my chapter is that, you know, in the favela that's mentioned in this, featured in the City of God, that uh, fantastic film from a number of years ago, there was one report that reported COVID rates of enormous proportions, like 40% of the population. The thing about, I suppose, uh, so I think in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, it, it, makes, uh, it makes some public policy sense to focus on the big utilities first because of the urban nature and the peri-urban nature of this virus, especially peri-urban when we're considering the informal settlements. Uh, it's most directly addressed in this book in the context of uh, Burkina Faso, where, where the scholars themselves are very worried about. They're, they're like, okay, COVID, one of the dangers of COVID, and this probably applies, uh, it would, I would suggest it would be something to look at in the cases of Brazil uh, with large informal settlements, uh, like places in Argentina that have large informal settlements, Mexico certainly that has like large, uh, densely packed, uh, very poor water access. Um, they're saying that some of the measures that the big utilities have taken are going to compromise as well the future of ever being able to connect those communities that are still outside of the formal service providers of the large utilities. So I hope that answers your question. It does, yeah. No, it's great. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions in the chat here, or at least one from Gregory Gould. I can, I can read them for everybody. Yeah, come on. Um, rethinking economic models as we sort through the failures of containing the virus. Oh, wait, maybe this is his comment to the questions that are posted. Oh, okay. um, but Stephen Bishop also has a question. Oh, um, so I, I, I heard a couple of reasons potentially why there might still be in certain countries uh, a push for private companies even though they seem to be less efficient and, and less economically viable. I'm just wondering, you know, could, could you run through the primary reasons why they still happen? Is it, is it primarily pressure from the, the uh, global bank, like you mentioned? Is it primarily just corruption, like trying to pull the wool over the public's eyes and say it's more efficient while certain people are getting kickbacks? Or is it something else, a combination thereof? I think in Latin America, the trend right now, or the one that we have to be more worried about, is probably this trend of corporatization or commercialization of public services rather than the privatization per se. Privatization uh, is, in terms of uh, concession contracts, et cetera, is still an issue in Peru, is still an issue in Brazil. It's going to be an issue in Uruguay. It's an issue anywhere where right-wing governments uh, with market orientation take office. Um, so I think that's still an issue, but what we're seeing as well in terms of why uh, countries would be deciding to uh, privatize their public services, we're not seeing the same kinds of conditionalities on the loans. That was certainly the push for the privatization in the 1990s. But again, the World Bank is still influencing the sector and the CAF, uh, which is one of the major financiers for water and sanitation infrastructure in Latin America, 
is also very, very interested in using this public money to leverage uh, private money. And really the, the dominant argument that's made, and this is an ideological one, because I don't think it necessarily makes a lot of sense when you think about <clears throat> how expensive and complicated it actually is to privatize water, is this argument that they're the only ones who have the money necessary to expand the services, right? Because when we're talking about the sustainable development goals, there are 17 of them. They're not, they're vast. Sustainable, their government, uh, sustainable development goal number six is to universalize access to water and sanitation services by 2030, right? That's a very, very, very ambitious agenda that could be part of a socialist agenda, right? I mean, this was an agenda that came from a bottom up. So to answer your question again, I think it is mostly pressure from international financial institutions, these multilateral lenders. Uh, and so in the context of severe debt, uh, there's influence, but we don't see the same kind of conditionalities. But again, we still have this uh, common sense, this neoliberal common sense that the private sector is the only one with, with the finance necessary to get this work done. Great. Um, we have a question from Ann Stewart. Um, uh, Professor Spronk, I wanted to thank you first off for the talk. I thought it was fascinating. And I preface my question by saying that my area is Africa. So apologies for any ignorance that I'm putting out on public display. But my question is also closely related to Dr. Bishop's. Um, I'm very interested in the kinds of conditionality and if the legacy of the 80s and 90s and the IMF's uh, SAPs is really what we're talking about when we look at privatization of water systems and is the blended financing the mode by which uh, the World Bank or the IMF can go about trying to reduce those kinds of conditionality loans or reverse them even? I think instead of focusing on the actual bricks and mortar and the concession, they're focusing on the money. I think it's a strategic move that they've made globally because we see it dominating all of these questions about financing development around the sustainable development goals. They talk about blending. And so in the Europeans are actually the ones who have pioneered blending. And so there's a wonderful group called Eurodad that's done a number of surveys and studied the European experience with blending. And what they suggest from that experience, and there was a report in 2017 that I can send uh, to Jamie after, uh, which suggests that they did a review of all the sectors. Like what happens when you use blending as the mechanism to achieve this universal access in an, in an infrastructure related service like water and sanitation? Well, they did a survey of all these blended instruments that the Europeans have been, had been using at that time for about 10 years and found that only 2% went to water and sanitation. Most of this development financing is going to the extractive industry. Mm. It's going to uh, large infrastructure projects related to industrial development, and it's going to banks, and it's going to the middle income countries. So it's not going to sub-Saharan Africa where it's needed most. Because when we see questions of access, when you see those graphs in terms of global graphs, Latin America is actually still climbing up, like access to water and sanitation services in general is improving. And so it's totally relevant for Jamie to be focusing on the rural areas, on the marginal areas within cities, because these are without access. Well, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are places where 73% of households don't have water access in their, in their home, right? I mean, you don't see any statistics like, like that in Latin America. Yeah, we're seeing some uh, we're seeing some worrying trends. I think with this new push for blended financing. Okay, thanks so much. I think I answered your question. Did I? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Stephen. I have one, but I also if we want um we have some time to discuss, we can leave that too. But Stephen, go ahead. Okay, um, so I'm just sort of tag teaming with Ian here because uh, I'm also an Africanist. I'm not uh, very conversant in Latin America. And in general, I would definitely say that I'm much more in favor in, of public you know, commodities like water being uh, taken care of by the state rather than by, <coughs> excuse me, than by, uh, you know, 
commercial interests or, or private companies. But my experiences across several countries in Africa are that the governments are doing an absolutely atrocious job, as you just uh, hinted at, um, in providing uh, water access to their citizens. So I'm wondering if, if it is perhaps a case where some private interests might be beneficial in African countries. I can't believe I just said that, but no, I did. I, in fact, we, you know, this insider tip, we had a little debate on this in one of the chapters that I insisted to be included in the book, which is on Nigeria. And Nigeria is one of these really corrupt states that does not provide for its citizens. You know, Lagos is the largest slum state in the world, right? It's, according to a colleague of mine who works there, he, he does maternal and child health services. And he was uh, went to Lagos. He's been to Lagos many, many times because he's from Benin. But he insisted in a recent trip, his partners, he's like, take me to see the projects. And he told me that he was absolutely traumatized. I don't know, I don't know where you work, Stephen, but he described it as apocalyptic and that some of the women that they were talking about were talking to in the like in the outer outskirts of Lagos had had something like 14 pregnancies and none of the children survived. I mean, it's just like, it's horrific, like conditions, right? I mean, so different from Latin America. Again, I don't think we see these kinds of extents of, of, of I can't think of anywhere in Latin America where the conditions are, are that bad. Um, so La yeah, Africa is a very different place from Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, but in terms of uh, one of the reasons why we included the, the chapter on Nigeria is actually on the informal providers, on the small businesses the small little water vendors who are like the people with the water trucks and the people with, you know, that fill the tanks. And this certainly happens in Latin America. We've seen it later. There's a great literature um, on these. I love that book by Eric Schwingadu and he starts his book on uh, water and power uh, talking about hanging out with a water truck, like water tank guy providing services to people who do not have HUD network services. Um, so they certainly fill this gap right, that we, we need these providers, otherwise those communities would have no water at all, because in the context, context of corrupt governments, where the public is not responding at all to citizens' needs, or only responding to like a very small section of people who live in the, in the capital who are part of the elite, um, then we need, you know, more, we need pressure, and we need to think about other kinds of ways to improve the relationship between those informal providers and the, in the, in the formal providers. And I think we see models of that happening in a place like Colombia, where there's, there's really an interesting attempt and a lot of tensions within the model in Colombia, um, where we see this attempt of the state to try to figure out, okay, we know that we're not gonna make it with our pipes into these communities because the infrastructure needs are so enormous. It's gonna be so expensive. It's gonna take so much more time let's work with these smaller providers in terms of thinking of system upgrading, thinking of ways to regulate, to improve the water services for those communities, right? So that I have some state role in terms of a regulator to open a space to improve those services, I do think becomes a sort of provisional measure in the context of absolute scarcity of, of public services. Formal network public services by a big public utility. If I'm being selfish, jumping in. Um, I just have one, another question. You mentioned that with the universal basic services and the, and the minimum sort of guaranteed um, quantity of water, you, you sort of had a side comment of like, there are some issues there, mm -hmm. but overall, this is an important policy. And I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm only kind of becoming aware I'm studying meters right now. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking for a lot of meter, you know, information and, there are like some sort of mentions about the problems of this like minimum water allotment. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what that looks like? Yeah, here I'm thinking mostly of the work of geographer Alex Luftus actually has a co-wrote the chapter on water rights in our book, but he's written a lot about this issue in South Africa from the perspective of the kind of damage that it does, uh, particularly for larger households. Uh, one of the big issues is in the tariff structure. When you have a minimum base supply, you have like a platform. And then once you hit over six kiloliters per month, the rate skyrockets. 
And so this has been particularly difficult in the context of the AIDS pandemic, the HIV AIDS pandemic, where if you have a household that's large with sick members, those households have been crushed by their water bills. And so there has to be a way to address that issue in the context of waste lifeline supply. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because when the state's not making any money off of that basic supply, they up the rest of them. And that's fair in some ways, because then the people who are filling their swimming pools with water are paying more per liter for water than those who are in the lower bracket. But it also has some pernicious effects if it's not targeted properly. And there has to be relief for large households. So I presume then that the maximum quantities would also sort of hit those same sort of households the same way. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, I, the first time I read this, Maximo Vitalis was in this chapter on Medellin. I'd never heard of this uh, concept yeah. before, but yeah. I think what they're getting at in the chapter, and I haven't talked to the author of the doctors themselves, but um, is really expanding this notion of socio and economic rights. Like we have to keep our ambitions higher than just talking about minimum supplies, I think is what they're trying to say. Yeah. And if yeah. you want, I mean, Greg Breiters has a chapter in this, but he mentions the problem of the of the uh, basic lifetime supply very quickly in his chapter on Cape Town. It's one of the cases that's been very well studied in the literature on water. Great, okay. Other questions? I don't wanna chime in or we can... We don't have to go for the whole hour 15 no, minutes. We don't. I know, it's actually, it's a holiday here. And it's it? my birthday. Oh, um, oh, yes, well, thank you so much for showing up, everybody. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really great to be able to have you. This is like a, um, a nice end to, the, to a long day. So um, is there any other questions? I just don't want to cut anybody off that was in the middle of it. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time and your patience with, with the technology and reaching everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Uh, Wonderful to meet some of you, and I'll send you the PowerPoint presentation in case you want to. Oh, that'd be great. That would be really great. I'd love to be able to keep that. So, okay, thank you so much. Everybody have a nice, safe night. Bye. Happy Remembrance Day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.